the screen that's got the news on it and share. Hopefully you will see that, everybody. Yep. Good. Um, news. Um, it's been four months. Scary how time flies. Um, there's a lot that's happened in the four months since our last event. And I've only done a snippet of some of the things that I've, I've seen of some of the things that were interesting to what we've been working on and what we've seen. Um, and I've tried to, uh, I've got a little bit of a Q&A at the last section of the news for the, the group of just how people have been doing stuff and what they've been working on. So, um, right. First thing I, I spotted that has been around for a while, but it's, it's getting some traction in the news lately is this memory bug thing that um, Matt Petrowski did a little video on. Um, and it's to do with certain um, queries and processes that the uh, FileMaker engine is, is running natively. And I've only briefly looked at this and the, the, the team are looking at how we're using it um, and how it's going to benefit us. Um, I don't, the, the video link's there, watch the video. It's about a 35 minute video of what causes this. And in the middle of it is quite enlightening how, um, I think it's a group of people who've got involved in this to try and work out how to fix this bug. And they are putting a quote before the, um, um, whatever the query is, whether it's the JSON query or whatever it is, and they're putting a quote and, and then the query. And that seems to stop the memory bug from happening. No one knows why, <laughs> but if you don't put the quotes in front of the, of the actual command, uh, this gives you an idea. So it was running at 402 uh, meg was the real memory of FileMaker. And he ran the query once and it went up to 758 meg consumed. Put the quote in and it barely moved. So. So it's just something in the code. Have a look at that. It's it's going to be on the video, um, and I will post these links into the chat before I leave as well. So, um, but that's one I've seen, and I know Ben, who works our developer, he's been looking at that on our side, seeing whether or not we're using those functions and running those commands just to see whether or not we can get around that memory bug. Um, uh, it seems to be Mac only that I've seen on all the talking of stuff. I've not seen this issue come up in Windows. It may be coming up in Windows, but I've not seen anyone do any demos. And all the all the screens that you see are always people using a Mac showing the memory consumption. So uh, thanks for being very mind. Have a look at the video. It's well worth watch. Um, and certainly if you're using those sort of functions and commands, then it's going to be a benefit because it will make you run out of memory after time. It's very quickly, it runs up the memory as well. It goes up in like 20, 30 meg chunks every time you run the command. So it's not, it's not small. So um, uh, another one, it's which we have Tony here um, and uh, I'm sure he will pitch in and, and tell more about this. Uh, I thought this is a brilliant post. Um, uh, he went helpful ever on fun facts of file maker and I went through it and within five minutes I was like oh I didn't realize that existed I didn't realize that existed <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's all functions and bits and pieces um it's a great great video it's quite long um but um Tony has done a fantastic job of time indexing all the things so there's, there's a hell of a lot of time indexes on it but again I'd, I'd urge you to go and have a look at this and um Tony does live Q and A as he's going through that as well so people are asking questions about our uh, scenarios of how certain functions and fun facts have been used within FileMaker. Um, uh, it's on Penny's wish list to go through it. She hasn't had time to go through it all yet, but it's all of all of our lot are looking at this and going through it. Cause I'm sure you're, you're going to come out of there with something going, oh, I didn't know about that. So uh, great post and thanks Penny for doing it. So much appreciated. Um, the other one, which is more of a personal one and then thing I've noticed um, only because in our last event, I did a bot scenario where I basically spoke about having uh, bots running, which we have used for years. Um, and we have an automated bot process. Um, and I've noticed three or four videos now that are talking about having bots in FileMaker that have sprung up post our event. So I don't, I'm sure it's a coincidence, <laughs> So, um, but it, this is a good one. So it's, it's um, Nick Hunter basically does a three part session, um, which he, he did with basically FM training and it, they go through the elements of how they're using bots, why they use bots, the pros, the cons. And it's a more detailed version of the summary that I gave of my bot process that we use, but it does enlighten um, ideas and the ways they're, they're working. One of the sessions they were doing is having uh, like a self-service. So the client can drop a file 
and then pick a bot that they would like it to run on. And they're talking about running these in AWS. So they have various instances of AWS instances running. So it's a clever approach. Um, and it, it's a way of offloading that process away from the client or away from the server. And they explain the reasons why. And the classic reasons, which I did discuss in that previous event, was all those functions that you can do in client that you can't do on perform scripts on server. You want to run an Apple script to do something. You want to copy files to do something else and various other aspects. You just can't do those sort of things on server. So that's why we use bots. And the safety is, is the classic thing is if you get a runaway script that goes mad, you can jump in. The reason why we use it, we can jump into debug live in a script that's running. And then you can see where in the script it, it is. You just can't do that and perform script on server. And you can't do that on the server side. So there's a lot more functionality. And I know after I did that talk, I've had a few people come back and say, right, can we get under the hood of how you do your bot process a bit more? Penny and I are working on that to admittedly clean up some of the code because I don't want to show some of that code because that is five, six year old stuff in there that's got loads of comments in it that don't need to be there anymore. So we're cleaning that up. I will do a subsequent session on that and explain how we use it and what the under the hood of that is in a bit more detail in future events. But I thought it was in, interesting as people talking about bots, how to do stuff. And um, if you've got the ability to run in AWS and you run instances in AWS for a bit on the server, or you've got clients as well, then I think that is worthwhile watching that link there because it'll give you an idea of how to get that built, how to get it set up and, and get running. So I think it's a good one. Um, and then the other one which happens, um, which I'm sure you've all watched, um, uh, which was the under the hood of 19.5. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, it certainly tells you about the landscape of where FileMaker is going, some of the things they're doing, parallel backups, um, uh, the versions of Ubuntu, they're supporting two versions of Ubuntu now that are doing uh, Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 20. And they're saying the reason why they've done that is to give us developers time to test the latest version. Um, I think it's some of the framework of um, under Linux that they don't want to abandon those 18 frameworks because there's some framework changes between Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 20. So um, I think it's, it is a support issue, but I think it's a support issue for us and also a support issue for them to make sure that all the functionalities that us as users come back and then post on the forums and go, oh, this doesn't work in 20. And they go, all oh, right, the reason why is this framework's now changed and shifted. We've got to address that before we go forward. They're on full releases. Uh, 20 is a full release. It's not a beta release, it's supported. Um, but it's just something to bear in mind. If you are running the Linux server, then um, I would certainly get onto the latest version of that, get on 19.5 and run Ubuntu 20 um, and start testing your servers and just make sure everything's compatible and working. Um, in there, one of the things is, which was part of my question afterwards was, um, I'm looking to run 19 as soon as possible and I'm looking to roll this out. Parallel backups for us will be an absolute boon and a godsend i think from all the talk that i've heard about parallel backups is that is one of the features that will so totally help us um our backup strategy our weekend backup when we're talking about our docket backup which is for all of our roll mail dockets um all our print dockets for dispatch johan go on so have you seen that they've changed the technical specification if you want to run that one so you are aware of that not it's seen they've changed the technical specification. All I've heard and read is the fact that they don't advise running parallel backups unless all your clients are running 19.5 as well. Yeah, so that's a really good reason as well. But they also changed the technical specification, especially for running parallel back backups. No, so, yeah, but yeah, you could tell yeah. us about that if you would like. <laughs> okay, yeah, so they, uh, they, uh, they need us to run on, on faster and better processors. Uh, and for reason, because they're trying to offload the uh, different processors of work. So even the, spe the specification now, they're trying to get us to use more threaded processors to make it work faster. So uh, it's a, you can just Google it on, on technical specification for 19.5 you see it straight away. Okay, so that is good because that shouldn't have bothered me because I'm in VM anyhow, so I can spin up more processes and add more resources if I want to. So I'm fortunate as far as that's concerned. I feel for the people that are running this on just a single, I don't know, Mac Mini and they're going to go parallel backups. So it's going to be a bit of a problem then. Um, but okay, so if they've looked at that and they're offloading that, it's great. Finally, it's getting to the point where 
FileMaker is becoming multi-threaded, which is what we've always wanted. So we've always wanted to be able to say, right, I'm going to put more resource at it. I'm going to let it spin up and, and let it use it. Because in the past, we gave it a load of resource and it just didn't use it. You, you realized, oh, no, you go and check it. I've given it eight cores and it's only using one. So thanks for that. So hopefully they're using all the cores, which is great. The issue I have around it, the parallel backups on that side of it is, is one thing. Um, those of you that are using it, the, the concern I have, and this is my question to the group about this, um, one show of hands who is using 19.5, who is actively using it. Good, there's a few hands going up, which is fab. That means there's a lot of people that can answer my question. <laughs> um, the advice is to run 19.5 client. Now, from my point of view, I've got the horrible job of rolling out 200 clients um, and getting them all upgraded overnight and get them all using it and make sure the hardware supports it and make sure everything else works. So that's my headache. In the past, we've always been able to run hybrid where you could have some 19.5 clients and some 19.42 and some 18 because still on the technical specification, it says if you run server 19.5, 18 is supported. But what I'm hearing in the pipeline is if it is, those features they've put in for like parallel backups that's using the file store sort of side of stuff, it needs the clients to be on there. So my question is, do I get any benefit of any of these features if I'm still running hybrid because it still says technical specification, I can run 18 clients until I've upgraded everyone. Is it worth me doing the server now, upgrade the clients over time and then get the benefit when it happens? Or because there's one client that's on 18, does all of it turn off? Where, where did you see that, Gary? Um, it was advised in that under the hood. They said it is advisable that you are running 19.5 client to use the file store locking or the transactional part of the client stuff. Because that, as you're writing, if you're doing a parallel, because it does the parallel backups doing the progressive and the full backup simultaneously. So because it's doing both, when you're doing the progressive backup, the client needs to be writing the changes to the server so the server knows what to do. And they're saying it's handled better if it's running 19.5 client. That's what I got from that when I watched it. I may be wrong. Uh, uh, another really, really important thing you need to be aware of before you upgrade. Do you ever use file options and choose auto login on like a server file where you run PSOS or in a web file where you store all your web traffic? Um, what an auto login. So yeah, so in file option to set up a username and password with like, like a data view with a login, so yep. you don't have to cater for that. For uh, okay, so that that doesn't work in nineteen point five. So then you have to have a, a specific user because if you're running a PSOS on one of these files where you have auto login, it used to work on nineteen four, but from nineteen five and forward, it's using the credentials that you had. Uh, triggering that script off and that script that user usually doesn't exist in that file because you have a data viewer or edit records or something like that that's locked in yeah. so then you need to fix that on all your files that doesn't have credentials like that that's a headache but not a major one so that's fine i can live <laughs> with sure that not. but thanks no. for letting me know because there's about three or four files that would literally break overnight <laughs> so yes. it just won't work learn that the hard way yes yeah, right. Okay, fine. Useful today. Thank you. Much appreciated. Anyone else got any queries about whether or not you could run a hybrid still? Because I would like to move to parallel backups tomorrow because I can see the benefits of them straight away. Or is the news that I've mentioned not known to people and it's the first they've heard of it? I've heard and I've read a little bit about it, but I can't say that I know more than what I've read and what you just told us. Right. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, I'll put you back to Clarice then. James has heard of it too. Again, uh, first I've heard of it and first James heard of it, apart from talking to you earlier. Okay, fine. All right, I may push it back to Clarice then and see what they do. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll raise it with them and say, look, I've, am I misunderstanding and misinterpreting what you're, you're saying with that? And if I'm not, then I'll probably upgrade server to, on one of our test servers and then test it and see. But um, I don't even want to go down the route of putting it on a test server and try and test it yet because it's just not seen the point. So. Um, uh, what uh, uh, machines are you running it on? On, on Windows or, or on Linux or Mac? Or uh, Windows, running on Windows. Okay. So, so again, then uh, if you have aren't using IIS like uh, like standard installation, it's going to re-rule all the law uh, uh, rules that you've written regarding all your sites. 
So you need to be aware of that as well. That comes, there was the same problem in 194 and the same problem in 195. So if you have a lot of web traffic, you need to be aware of that issue. Okay. Yeah, I think that test server is going to get a bit of a pounding, thanks. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Five for a second. Yeah. Yeah, you were good for me, Matt. No, you have to thought in here. Um, when yeah. I upgraded Gary, I had to uh, reinstall the server because it wouldn't let me log in anymore. That's also happened with 19.5.3, not 19.5.2. So if you install 19.5.2 first and then 19.5.3, you will don't have that problem. Right. Okay. I must have missed one. But yeah, it was a painful night on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I can it's always a holiday, which is a subject of my talk. <laughs> uh, so basically, if you take the latest install of 19.5.3, it breaks. If you go 19.5.2 and upgrade, it's fine. Yes. Genius. Okay. Now, I don't know. There's just three minor things that they upgraded in 19.5.3, but they did this change that caused headache for every one of us. Mm. Definitely was. I think okay. that would be one of the questions you should be talking to Doug about. <laughs> I, I was going to say, if Doug does turn up, please not someone gonna answer you I'll watch the one. video back later. <laughs> please, please, someone quiz him on that, will you? Um, uh, and yeah, so uh, that is pretty much the news um, I have. Um, and I'm not to cut and run, but I'm aware of the time and I'm going to get hassled that I'm late. Um, so um, I'm going to leave this meeting and Joel, you've got my number. If I leave this meeting and it kills the entire call, let me know, but it should be fine. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, okay, next, I will let you know. Yeah, let me know. Uh, for the next event, I would love to stick around and talk as I normally do to the early hours of the morning and I will be at the next event. I'm just so sorry I couldn't do it for this one. So, um, but I appreciate you all turning up and I will be watching the video back because I'll be editing it. So um, I will hear everything. So, uh, so all the abuse you're about to give me for leaving, I will hear. Okay, so that's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, I appreciate it, everybody. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and pass that back to you guys. And I am going to leave. So uh, much appreciated. And I will see you at the next event. So wonderful. Cheers, guys. Bye. Catch up with you soon. Bye. Right. Thanks very much for that, Gary. Okay. Okay. Never liked him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. I haven't left. <laughs> <laughs> Too quick off the mark. Hey. Fantastic. You can see the application. I can't. Um, where's it gone? OK, right. Does that work? This Brilliant. This is going back to the employee. <laughs> okay, so this is a little problem I had on holiday. Um, there I am thinking everything's done when, of course, it isn't. So it's about the best way to connect when you're on holiday. You haven't got any Wi-Fi. Uh, hang on. Oops, sorry. Uh, can you find out who that is for me? Um, uh, so that's me, this is the talk, and moving on to the next slide. Okay, uh, I threw this together this afternoon so it may or may not work. So the problem, location, 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 always the problem. Uh, I was off on holiday. Can I just break in briefly? Okay. Hello, I'm just presenting. Uh, Christine's. Uh, by, she should be back by seven, but give her a call. Uh, okay, um, he's either she's going to call when he's on his way back. Got the house phone. Oh, okay. I will. I will get her to call it. Okay, but he is there. He'll he'll be back soon. All right. Bye. Sorry, personal issue going on. Missing child. <laughs> uh, apologies for the. <laughs> no, he's actually around the corner. Um, I'll have to try and rush through this and get a message to him. Uh, so, uh, where were we? I'm off on holiday. Uh, but, oh no! I have rather a big file that I haven't managed to upload before I went away, and I had to do some work on it and then upload it to the server. Oh, I thought, yeah, that'll be fine. 
I got this massive file, but I'll get it up there somehow. Um, it wasn't actually that big, I have to admit, but it was big enough. And I had the client calling me, saying, I really need it now. <laughs> James knows about this. <laughs> there is my client. <laughs> well, it isn't really, but there you go. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? It'll be fine. The Wi-Fi will be fine. I'm on holiday. Let's take it cool. Let's take it easy. Um, it's just obviously it's good to say, show a couple of holiday pics. <laughs> and um, let's try and upload the file. Oh, it wasn't that one. No idea how that snuck in there. Uh, back to trying to upload the file. <laughs> well, that one didn't work. Look at that lovely upload speed. That's actually exaggerating. It was not 8k a second. It was more like about 2k a second. And it was a good long time. And after about an hour and a half it decided it had to had enough and it wouldn't do it anymore it just cut the connection so oh dear well that's all right I'm going somewhere else that'll be okay it's an ambulance because we have a camper van that's converted from an ambulance off to another location in the middle of nowhere well for those who are technically minded it's Lillewa rather than Lalawa. and I am still Still on a family holiday, still coping with the what are you doing working <laughs> questions, <laughs> still coping with the kids demanding internet <laughs> and so forth. But if you will go camping, that's what you get. So that didn't work either at that location, so we're off again to another remote location. A yeah, lovely little medieval village in the middle of nowhere. And I gave James a call and said, any idea what to do? And James said, well, why don't you nip down to the nearest Starbucks? Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a helpful <laughs> suggestion, but there is not a Starbucks in sight, not within 200 miles. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, I get my act together. And I was thinking, uh, oh, no, I tried, I tried uploading from there. That looked a bit familiar. Here we go, 6k a second. I thought, well, okay, let's check the download and upload speed, see what we get. And what did we get? <laughs> this was not going to go anywhere, was it? Client is still going mad. Oh, sorry, I've gone back one instead. Uh, so, actually, I had two last resorts. I had a daughter who was with me who was heading back to Paris, and I thought, I can transfer the file to her machine. She can upload it from work. No problem. Unfortunately, that would have been about three days before the end of the holiday. Wouldn't have been too popular from the client. We're now about three weeks into my long extended holiday. Um, so I thought, OK. I've got mobile data. I really didn't want to use it because I'm mean. <laughs> and because as soon as I used it, I couldn't do anything else like look at all the porn. I mean, my favourite shows and so forth or anything. Uh, so that's what happens with mobile data. Somewhat faster than French internet speeds, public internet speeds. Worked fine. Uploaded the file. Client happy. Me happy, family happy, uh, not really. Family not happy because there was no data for them to enjoy sharing my <laughs> internet connection. Uh, I must press the one so we get angry kids. <laughs> End of holiday. Uh, so, really what I wanted to discuss was, uh, discuss, 
What I wanted to do was to discuss, I can stop sharing now. Um, so really what I wanted was some ideas of the best way of sharing data, uh, uploading data, getting an internet into a server, using FileMaker whilst you're on holiday. And is there any other way than other than using mobile data? Anyone got any ideas? One, you should get if you're... <laughs> 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 No, well, there is that. There, there is uh, another sneak peek you can do. Uh, and whenever you're transferring any kind of files, if you just upload yeah. them to a source like Amazon or Google, that's always much faster to take your file and then you can move them from there to your oh, actual okay. source. So the, for the uploading a file to a file maker service is always going to be slow. Yeah. Because it's also check for the file consistency before it opens up. So if you instead open it, moves it to a source like that and then to your service it will go a lot faster oh that's a great tip thank you uh, so whenever i have the bigger files i need to transfer in between two computers if i can't get access in between those i always upload them to google and then download them from google that's much faster than downloading them to come your computer or other computers or stuff okay. like that great hit great tip thank you anyone else anyone else had similar experiences I've done the same as that You'd have done Putting the same thing. Do, uh, box or yeah. Google or Dropbox. Can you can you guys hear this? Yeah. Yeah. So before you go, uh, I don't I don't do anything on my laptop or anything. I do everything on a remote desktop. Can you just spin up a, a machine that you switch off when you're not using it, and then just remote desktop into that rather than doing everything on your laptop? If the file was on it. If the, yeah. So yeah. when you're going away on holiday, don't take it with you in the first yes. place. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it in the cloud. Just do it on that. Uh, yes and no. It was all rather last minute and rather late and but like I said, if you always work remote, you yeah. never have the problem. Well, that's true. Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, but the, if the connection is that bad, the remote working would be crazy. Well, right, it can be. Bad. It's not as bad as trying to upload a file. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't. It wouldn't lose power if it lost the package. You'll do you always uh, develop on a local file. Why don't you develop on a server so that you only need to remote desktop to that server, wherever it is, and then transfer that file uh, into Windows? Usually I work on the server, but in this particular instance, I wanted to do quite a lot of data imports from stuff that I had on my machine locally. So I wanted to do those data imports locally for speed um, and then upload it to the server afterwards when I was sure everything was correct because we're in the middle of migrating to a new system but if you import data directly from documents folder or temporary folders on a server that's actually even faster than from your own computer yeah it would have been if i thought of that in the first place <laughs> <laughs> if i planned it properly yes i think you're more eager on going on holiday than what you was actually thinking uh, yeah about. i was more eager on going on holiday yes you're probably right and so certain about going on holiday, on holiday. Is look at what data connections are better. And that's what I also get from the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We are unlimited, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm not going there if we can't be unlimited. Talking about speeds, I was on a big boat um, a couple of weeks ago. And when you're in the uh, middle of the ocean, the bugs are all there. Mm -hmm. and, and the liner tries to charge a fortune for it. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was a, it, was, it was a waste of time, basically. However, a couple of days ago, last week, there was an announcement that um, Starling mm -hmm. had just mm -hmm. done a deal with Royal Caribbean. So they're going to get satellite to all of their cruise liners. Wow. So that made me think, which is basically what happens in Africa where there, there's nothing going on. Anyone know what the price of having a satellite dish for that service is? Has anyone looked Starling's into that? Starling's 89 quid a month. Yeah, there's usually a monthly deal on those. I've used one of the phones when I was climbing high mountains in Nepal. And how was it? It actually worked much better than you expected it to. I mean, I was totally remote on that spot and it still got satellite almost the entire time. Wow. Yeah, so, we looked at one of our sites that have got nothing. Yeah. yeah. 89 quid and 200 quid set up, something like that. Well, I mean, at home, it's 60 quid, 70 quid for a monthly. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, 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 yeah. How big is a dish? Is it, like, big. 
and it, you have to set that up and it remotely configures uh, itself. Okay. And so it's not saying you can have in your room on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could have Especially it mounted in a mid cabin. <laughs> but you could have it mounted on top of your camper van. <laughs> you could have you it, could it on a camper van. Yeah, yeah. The ninety two is not bad. Right. Yeah. 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 It okay. Yeah, it is definitely something we we looked at. It. We didn't go for it in the end, but. What's the uh, electricity to, uh, for that though? Well, he's got that. That's a worry now. That's isn't it? <laughs> 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 the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't want to obscure your satellite, your um, sun panels on top of the uh, <laughs> yes. camper van, do you? <laughs> your solar panels. Were you anywhere near a bank? No. Because they've normally got a pretty good internet connection, haven't they, bank? The only bank that we were near decided it wanted to charge me five pounds for, or five euros for taking out 30 euros. Well, or 50 euros. And I thought, I'm not doing that. So I was sulking at the bank. <laughs> Still, it was a lovely location. <laughs> anyway, thank you for that, everybody. Uh, and thanks for the uh, input, Johan. Since you're on the screen there, do you want to talk about Engage? Engage you? Sure, I can, definitely. Uh, but before that, I'd actually like to tell everyone about a um, presentation that was done at AutoEnter that really threw me off my chair. Uh, this guy um, from Soliant, he called Call. He um, talked about how, what kind of transfer actually takes place between FileMaker Go, FileMaker Pro, and FileMaker Server. I'm going to post you some links here in the chat so you can have a look at them yourself. There's two uh, like half an hour sessions where he by detail explained for different function on how many calls they actually do to file make a server. That really threw me off my share, understanding when I'm supposed to do things and not do things, calling server for different uh, purposes. So I urge you to have a look at those links. And then now when you're off doing that already, it's probably not so good time to talk about anything else, but I'll try anyway. So um, in November, mid-November, uh, I hope to see you all in Sweden because we're going to arrange an English talking conference on site. So not only uh, people from Scandinavia can come, uh, we've invited people from all over the world. So we already have 11 speakers from around the world coming to Sweden, and we hope to get more. We've been promised by uh, Marie Normand that uh, we will have uh, Clarice, um, employees on site so we will have a Clarice partner meeting and they were supposed to have a, a technical session as well so hopefully they get into some details what I've been will show you a little bit later on with Clarice studio but then also there will be a lot of other really nice uh, topics that will be bring to attention so if you want to have a look at uh, uh, that link engageu.eu you will get more information about who actually signed up already you want to share a beer with and then also of some of the topics that's already been added to the agenda. Brilliant. Whereabouts in Sweden is it? Uh, it's in Malmö, so you just fly into Copenhagen and then there's just a short train ride over the bridge of 20 minutes and then you ride straight into city center of Malmö and it's gonna be on a really old place called St. Gertrude, which is a venue from a very long time ago and a very cool place to have a conference on. Brilliant. Will there be snow? <laughs> In Malmö there is uh, a snow two or three days per year and then they can't get out and definitely not in November. So you don't have to worry about ice bears or anything like that. I was quite looking forward to this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, and what is the average price of a beer in Malmö? <laughs> um, it kind of depends on where you go. So the local pub it could be like um, 350 pounds or so, but if you go and have, want to have a Belgium beer, uh, it will be some more. But we will uh, throw a social uh, dinner on Sunday where we'll be having a beer party to try uh, beers out of Sweden. So that's also a good reason to come. It, it sounds like a very uh, good reason to come. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the other good reasons. <laughs> um, great. Um, did, did you want to talk any more about it or anything, uh, mention any of the speakers or events or anything or? Uh, I think yeah, probably if you have any questions, just feel free to ask me or else I think the homepage is pretty uh, stable of giving out the information needed to, to register, hopefully. Great, great site, by the way, Thank you. <laughs> your homepage. Yeah, really good site. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, we can all see that. 
Uh, okay. So, on some levels, it's not a presentation. Um, it's unpacking something that I did um, earlier in the year as a starting point for, for discussions. Um, I was having a conversation with Todd Geist. Um, and we were, we were talking, we were actually talking about Farmaker Cloud um, and the fact that if you go at the kind of low level, you get three files. And if you want, and up to 10 users, if you want more than 10 users and you want more than one files, it's the next, it's a, it's a price jump up to the next level. Um, and obviously that's also the way that in the past, some people have traditionally done hosting by limiting the number of files that you can have. Um, and he, he said, well, the number of files in a system is not a good proxy for the complexity of a system. Uh, and that led to a conversation which turned into uh, like a proper recorded conversation. There's a link at the very end of this uh, on the Context podcast around the issue of multiple files versus a single file. So that's what I'm going to look at is um, a bunch of stuff around why there may be reasons to consider using multiple files, not one file. I've, I've created lots of models for this and why this might be a good idea. Feel free to take notes during the thing and then we can kind of share wisdom about where things have and haven't worked for you uh, and stuff as well. But obviously for those who've been in the game quite a long time, Pre Farmaker 7, it was a single table per file, and there was a limit of 50 open files. So effectively, you could use up to 50 tables, a lot of jumping around through the hoops. Um, I was somewhat amazed to discover that you can still find the Farmaker 7 release notes on the Claris, current Claris website. The link is on my computer at work to the actual document I looked at. But the big thing was Farmaker 7 came along, suddenly Farmaker went relational. So now it was sold on file improvements. And you can now have multiple tables in one file. You can have as many as you like up to hard disk space. Uh, you can now relate them to each other. And obviously that turned up with the relationship graph as well to be able to kind of do a drag this from here to here to make the relationship happen. So that's the point at which what we now understand as relational FileMaker really started. But people who've been developing since before then almost certainly will have seen systems, some of which are still in existence, um, which, which started at this point because it was a technical limitation. Because then what happened was, as always, our, de our default behavior tends to be uh, we get a new feature in FileMaker and suddenly it becomes a new hammer to attack every single problem. Everything starts to look like the same nail. Um, but obviously, one of the first jobs that people start to do is go, oh, I can do this, so now I must, or I should, or I will. Take all of this stuff, stick it in one file. Um, now, obviously, the way that FileMaker has been sold over the years is exactly that, that everything, all your data, all of the user interface layer, the kind of the stuff that people click, and all of the scripted processes are in one file, self-contained, and that file can then grow and expand with your requirements. And that's not an untrue statement um, to sell. And I'm imagining that a number of people around us, some of us on this call, may have even got into FileMaker in that way. You just start with the product, start building something. It grows, it grows, you add the other things. That's kind of how it works. Um, and and that's not, that does work. It's not a wrong assumption. However, as we also know, when we've taken over systems from something that people wrote themselves for three years, that can lead to some very bad architectural decisions uh, as well as some bad UI decisions. So I wanted to look at a list of kind of models for why. So first of all, one of the things is that if, if you've come into it in this way, 
then you don't necessarily understand that actually having more than one file is even possible. You would see every file as a discrete piece of work, self-contained, everything about it is self-contained. There is, I think, some compelling reasons to consider uh, options which include multiple files with a caveat that you have to start from what is the problem you're trying to solve and what is the best way to solve the problem. So understanding what is available to us may lead us to different conclusions if we have the opportunity to do that. So clearly we start with like a unified model. You, t you put everything in one file and absolutely everything is in a single file. That is often around uh, something about ease of deployment. If everything's contained in one file, um, then it's easy to send a copy to somewhere else, somebody else, or easy to put it onto a server. Um, you don't need to kind of do anything else. But it, as with most of these things, as well as there are some very good pros, there are also some cons. So in those early days, how what do you do about updates? What do you do about updating data when you want to change the core scripting of the file or something about the, the data model. Um, basically, you either had to work live on the server, which has some dangers. And obviously that is until the advent of the data migration tool more recently, or the stories of people spending the whole weekend doing a scripted import just so they could take a clone of the file and move every single piece of data from the original file into the new file. Um, and, and the reason for not developing live might be things like the dangers of locking serial numbers or, you know, there are some dangerous reasons not to go into the relationship graph and add a new field in the middle of the working day, um, just because of what FileMaker is then doing um, to the file. It does, it does deal with like access kind of issues. So you're, you've just got usernames and passwords in to everything including all your security is inside the one file. But depending what the file is built like, um, not unlike Gary, who might have a very, very, very large file that takes him a very long time to back up. Um, backups can both be huge and slow. And obviously, um, previously, users used to be slowed down during the time the backup was happening. Um, we have mentioned parallel backups and whether or not that kind of really helps. And I have a feeling I've played with it. I have a feeling it may. Um, but the systems that get created when this is the basic model, I have called the multiple extension or greenhouse design model. So you need a new feature, you add a whole new bit. You add some new layouts. Um, because you've now got tab in inter tabbed interface, you can see the development along the timeline of when a file maker feature turned up as to what theme was used with a specific layout that you used, what feature was used. Uh, and obviously the biggest thing is that the relationship graph becomes completely unusable at some level. If you come into a mutual system particularly, uh, you have no idea what anything's, what anything's doing uh, specifically. And when you take over user systems, you then have 15 versions of the same table as a table occurrence, just because they didn't realize you could relate the data in a way that would all work through a relationship. Um, the talk that Johan mentioned is around, so how much data is moving around when you go to this layout and see this? So we know that, first of all, when you open a file with a kind of angel of death kind of um, relationship graph, Pharmac has to walk over the whole thing to reserve cash for it. Or you get the other kind of, we'll call it an extreme anchor boy method that, where I'll show you one in a minute, where you know there's, there's a million TOs and they're all well disciplined, but they're still all in the relationship graph and Pharma's got, Pharmac has got to work out how to reserve space for it. Technically, this is technical debt the stuff that other people have, have done in terms of poor design. So uh, just because it's in one file doesn't actually make it any good, doesn't make it bad necessarily. But there are, I think there's some reasons why particularly systems that other people may have done who, who aren't 
as skilled as some of us might be, or hopefully are, then it can lead to all kinds of problems that are very difficult to unpick. Um, so obviously one of the one of the first kind of big changes to to the model was the separation model. I think it was Colleen Hammersley who first kind of introduced it into the community quite a few years ago. And this is where you have a file that is just user interface and all of the table occurrences that are on the graph uh, actually point to a second file and you use the table occurrences from the second file in your first file. So you create the file in the first place with some fake tables and then you add an external file reference and then just go and point the table occurrences to the external version, not the internal version. Um, it became quite popular. I don't know it took off fully as the kind of default way of doing things. But obviously when, particularly when FileMaker Go came along, this is a great model to consider because you actually potentially want a totally different interface file. You know, when, when FileMaker Go first came along, the first thing we did was open one of our layouts in FileMaker Go and go, oh, that works, but no, it's not usable. I really do have to design an interface that's for a phone or an iPad. Um, so this is a this is a model around making the interface work for the device, but working simultaneously with the same set of records. Um, obviously, it then introduces the issue of, well, how do you cope with local security? Which file has which usernames and which passwords in? Um, and uh, given that we, we don't want to be kind of creating bespoke schemes, it means there's more work to be done in terms of setup and management, particularly if you have a large number of users. And it led to some really, really bizarre workarounds. So particularly if you weren't interested in, or even weren't allowed to change anything in the file, which was the core data file, people would go off and create a list of fields that were just utility fields waiting to be renamed as something else. Um, if you look at some of the early stuff that Kevin Frank wrote on, um, on his site, it's got like ridiculous workarounds for how they used to do naming strategies for, for weighting fields. So you create a hundred fields that currently had no use so that in the future you could use it without kind of having to go and touch the, the core file. Um, but obviously, again, there's a, there's a use case for it. There's a very kind of interesting use case. Um, and some of the things that follow have a little bit of hybrid with how separation model works. So that's one where you'd have files that were essentially user interface for the device, uh, just talking to uh, the data file, these versions with external file references. And people then tried to kind of copy other models from, from wider computing and try and make it work in FileMaker. So the event model, which is MVC, model view controller, um, well understood kind of in web in web apps now. The model is the data. So you have a file that just is full of data and therefore the relationship graph in there is literally about how the data is related to each other, nothing else. It's just about how the data works as a relational thing. The view obviously is the, whatever you write is the front layer user interface. That has very few relationships in the relationship graph because all it is doing is then calling the controller file. The controller file is full of scripts and how to do transactions, how to do this thing. And obviously the relationships in there are in fact just to drive being in the right context for doing a piece of work with the data. So, so you end up with three different types of relationship graphs um, again, I, it's moderately hard to implement because it's you have to get your head around separating things that previously have all been in the one box. Um, and it, it, some people have used it well. Not many people have really, really played with it. But essentially, what you're doing is from the from the view, you're passing 
some instructions and maybe some record keys into the controller file. The controller file goes off, grabs the data, acts on it, and might give you some kind of notification back. Um, but that has to be done in more than one file. That kind of argument that it might be able to be done in two now, but that, that kind of requires multiple files. Um, for people who are doing a product uh, more than like a, a, a user's a customer's file, obviously the idea of having, having something that's a core, so you go, here's, here's the basic functionality of this, um, if I need to add something else, then I don't go and change the core file. What I do is give you another file that has all the, all the functionality. So if you want to add an emailing module, then it lives in its own file. We might have set up how to connect the core file to the email initially. And if you don't have it, it's, it doesn't work. But this is a way to deliver extra extra features which in this in the vertical market space means you can sell it as an add-on feature but the core you you want to keep very much um the same and obviously that one of the things that helped here was being able to have variable file references so creating an external file reference which is a double dollar variable that you create in a script at runtime means you can hook it up to a different file for a different customer because that file is then that the link to that file can be then in data as opposed to in scripting um the downside is obviously that that link is then set when the file opens and you can't change it on the fly to a different file so if you need to change it you need to have a some kind of switch in your interface that says oh no now go and use this version of the the data and then close and reopen the file, which lots of people aren't interested in that being their modus operandi. Um, but the advantage, uh, one of the advantages of th that kind of model where you've, 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 you've kind of added those kind of things to, to another file uh, is when, particularly when card windows turned up, um, is, is around being able to do something in this other file while you keep the context of where you are, which can be key, particularly if somebody has helpfully written a tabbed interface for you. And if you go off somewhere else and you come back, you're always on the wrong tab. So uh, I think that, that fits best with a, the kind of, like I say, the, the vertical market sales market. Um, so kind of on from the separation model, uh, looking at, the reason why you might have multiple files is based on department. So if you take the separation model, but don't just say, but say, oh, okay, I can have multiple separated UI files. Well, you could do that based on the part of the business that you're in. So question like, do the people who are working in accounts really need to see everything to do with the incoming warehouse stock? Because that's what they're working, that's what they're working on. So if you split up the work by department across the company, then each department can end up with its own UI file. Um, uh, one of the things is that all of those, like we'll call them starter solutions, pre-packaged, here you go, you can download this, it'll do everything for you, makes the assumption that everybody wants to see every single piece of data all the time uh, in the one interface. So they've made some, very basic assumption. So I'm just going to quickly show you. I did download last night the very latest version of FM Quick Start from DB Services. So as well as you're you're taking what they've designed for you, um, the assumption is that this interface is going to do the job for you. It's frankly got everything, but the question is, well, does that work in your organization or do you have to start ripping things out um does equally one of our issues in europe is that it's all based on being in dollars uh, with zip codes and so some of these may be less than useful uh, in terms of the amount of work we might have to do to turn it into something usable 
Um, but I did want to then just go show you the relationship graph. Uh, because the other thing you are inheriting uh, is this, which is extreme anchor boy. It clearly makes everything work. So you could logically follow it, but it's a massive graph to make that happen. So as well as being given a solution, you're also taking on board everything that that, that implies. Um, and that, that may or may not be um, a bonus for you. Um, but the advantage of, the, of a kind of department model where you've split, split stuff up is that is you've got an additional layer of security. You only have a set number of users in a particular file. So the people in the warehouse don't even get to play in the accounts module or the accounts file. So therefore you've added to some security because they don't even have a username and password in there. And the people in accounts can't accidentally receive, uh, as happened in the company I was working with, put a one in a field and then did replace field contents. It maybe looked like everything, every single thing that was on back order had been sent. Um, so you're kind of avoiding user, user disasters uh, by, that, by that method. Um, kind of the parallel to that is in fact, rather than splitting the business up by what your job title is, you split it up by the kind of tasks that you are required to do within a system. Uh, so somebody who is at a manager level has a series of tasks that they're doing, which is potentially very different from somebody who's doing data entry or somebody who's just doing reporting and KPIs. Um, so they, that, can, that can be cross business, cross functional. It's like the department model, but just starting from a different point of view. And obviously this, to make this work well for you, uh, does require you've you've done a lot of work with the client, the customer about what workflows are required and what workflows sit together um, in terms of who's who's doing that and and driven by what's the business logic for separating some of this uh, some of this out is there is there an actual advantage is it because people are doing time shift and so these people just need access to this part of the file in the day. You have people who just work in mornings. Um, and in these kind of files, the external file references could be a hybrid. Some of it is internal local, local tables. We have a hard, you know, or a, or a separation model where you have a hard coded link, but also could be uh, dynamic as well. The issue if you, clearly one of the issues if you split work across files um, and it's not, it's the file, not just the UI layer, is you have to consider, well, how am I gonna, what do I need to do about syncing? Does the data stay where it is? Does it ever need to be somewhere else? Do I need to make a way of transferring, rounding up the records at the end of the day and at least just moving them to somewhere else? Um, but for me, I think a, a compelling reason to consider this uh, as a model is around testing. So, so anything that involves separation means you can switch out the data that you're using for some known but valid test data. So you can run a script and check that everything happened right with some test data that is real, but you're not creating records in the live system. Um, I think that for me, that's one of the big reasons, pluses, I would say, to consider using multiple files. Um, for those of us who, uh, whose training used to be involved reading books, not reading the internet, um, if I make a training series majored on lots of work on helping you understand what kind of thing it was that you were saving to a table. What should the table be called? Is it parts? Is it orders? Is it something else? massive thing about en about the entities um which i to be fair has colored my view on some of these issues around the first thing you do is analyze not just what the business processes are but analyze what's the data that you have and it doesn't necessarily follow 
that just because you have then worked all of that out, that you then understand the tables. The question is, do the customers, you would assume that the customers need to be in the same place as the orders. But the question is, is that a fair assumption? Are there other places where actually the data could and should live in another file for a number of reasons? So for example, if you have a system that's storing a lot of documents, well, why would you consider not having those documents in the same file um, and just having a file of documents? Well, backup strategy is one. If you have a large file with lots of externally secured, stored secure PDFs and it's suddenly 50 gig, then you don't want to be backing that up on a, on a remotely the frequency that you might want to back up some other stuff because it's going to eat up your hard drive even with the new kind of creating hard links to files. And then if you're moving it off to an external storage, you still got to move the whole thing. So suddenly you've got tens, maybe hundreds of gigabytes worth of data that's just contained in this one space. But what that does mean that if, if everything else is in one file, but the documents are in a separate file, then your main work file could be backed up every 30 minutes because it's literally just a bunch of text fields and is a lot, lot smaller. So there are some advantages to that. Maybe just back up the documents twice a day. I've put a note there about, well, that leads to a little bit of a need to be disciplined about logging every single document that's been put into the file so that if you have to restore from a backup that's an hour old, you could also recreate the individual records because you know what the documents are that need to be there, you know what the UID is or something like that. So there are, as ever, when you kind of go, hey, well, here's a solution, this will help. There may be some more moving parts to add. So it's not always free in that sense. Um, another example would be uh, a file which is just containing tables, which are used to drive value lists. You can, so you've got file B, which has just got data tables in it. Um, in file B, you create the value lists from those, from those tables and those fields. In file A, you can say, I'd like to use a value list from file B, please. There you go, thank you very much. The advantage of that is that you can give access to somebody at quite a low level to the value list file. And so if you want to change the value list, you just go into here and here's all the records that, you know, if you want to change what this is called and you want to change this, you want to add five new locations, you can just do it and then it will ripple through the whole system without, again, people having to be given granted access to, to manage value lists. So it helps your core security uh, and your core not letting the customer screw up your files, frankly, um, by, by kind of extracting that uh, into something else. Um, and something I have been very keen on for, for quite a few years is then the utility model where you want to do some modular programming. So that requires that you, you, have, you have a feature that can be well encapsulated, even in a small way, in a separate file. And things like pickers and calculators and searches are things that have been done well. I've written some articles about a couple of those. But what that, what that means is that this, this separate file can be called from the first file. You can run a script in the second file. Um, we have ways of running a card window in that file and uh, being able to kind of kick back in to a script that picks up the answer. That modular file, the goal of modular programming there is obviously that that, that piece of functionality is then available to any and every file that you ever create. So if you create multiple files for a customer, you can have a consistent piece of um, functionality that could be in three or four other files. There's no reason why that core machine type file even is on their server. It could just sit on your server and you could charge them for access or, you know, which is somebody tried that model in our community previously. But, but the, the, big, the big goal of that is that obviously you, 
create and maintain that code in one place. And once you know it works and you've tested it to death, then literally it's copy and paste a couple of scripts and you suddenly have that functionality just add an external file reference. Um, I think there's some compelling reasons to consider that this is one of the places that multiple files as our development method is, uh, is properly grown up. Uh, what else I've got? Um, so a, a functional model of why you might have more than one file. So if you have tasks that are either temporary or essentially change on a year. So a conference registration, for instance, details about the conference registration, uh, what you're collecting and that kind of stuff may change every year, but you want the core data about, hey, who came to end up eventually in some kind of mailing list file. So you, you kind of look at your system based on what functions are required at this particular moment in time. Um, other things like put like, you know, high, high throughput data entry. Why would you have, if you wanted to scan a million items into a database, why would you do it in your main file? Why would you not do it in another file and then have something at the end that packages up all the data you've imported uh, and move it, move it into your main file? Um, being able to consistently do batch processing. So you want to import a lot of records, pre-process the records, maybe consolidate them, maybe look for duplicates. Putting that into a separate file feels like a real possibility um, and a, a way again of just controlling that particular part of the task in hand. So looking at it in terms of, hey, what, what do we actually need to do at this point in time? And leading on from that is one of the things that we'll call them citizen developers frequently do is build a system. And it, every system, as you know, works when there's fewer than 10 records in it. And then when you get a million records in it and it's stopped working properly because it's ground to a halt, um, just because the way you designed it. Um, so the idea that we look at splitting up files based on how agile something can be, which requires that we start to measure things about how fast something is taking. Is there a better way to do this? If I took this out into another file, would that make the whole system faster just because it's not kind of storing a million unstored calculations, for instance? Um, and the, the quick win, I think, is that you can make minor, as with some of, some of these other models, you can make changes without touching the core tables. So particularly if you're not allowed to touch the main file, um, you, can, you can kind of make quick changes. Clearly, the cost of all of these involves more development because you've got create and manage another file, you've got to manage users, you've got to manage making sure that the themes are in sync, all that kind of stuff. So nothing in that sense is free, but what you might get out of it in this particular way of looking at it is, is the idea that you could have a more performance system, one that just, and if you're saving every user two seconds every minute of every single working day, then suddenly that adds up to a very large amount of time that you've released back or that they can be out selling or doing whatever else they're doing. Uh, next one. Uh, the experiment model. Why would you have more than one file? Well, so you can play around with new stuff without kind of damaging and touching anything. You can just, you can create a whole new eye, a new UI for how you do things. Create a brand new theme and experiment. Take it and sit it in front of customers and go, this is your existing file. Here's a new file. Look, it's got the same data in it, but look, it's brand new and fresh. It also means people can test when you have a smart idea about how you think you want to make somebody's job easier or better, you can demonstrate what that might mean. Uh, example I use in the podcast is I was watching some users via remote desktop and they clicked on a button and literally it was a value list with 
every 15 minutes from seven in the morning to seven at night as a, as a drop down list. Completely unusable because obviously you have to scroll with the scroll button at the bottom for quite a long time to get to the end of the day. And if accidentally your mouse goes off that, then it's gone away and you have to start all over again. Um, so that's an idea where I go, I've got a better way to do that. Well, now, if you experiment with saying, here's a file, it's kind of talking to your file, but do you think this is better? Do you think, you know, what do you think about where this should be? Um, as Todd rightly says in the middle of the podcast, um, that our job is not ever to make things worse. Our job is to make, in fact, things better. But the question is, what does better look like? And that requires that we have a way of measuring things, measuring throughput, measuring user satisfaction, uh, measuring speed. Um, is this thing that I've decided to do a faster way to get to that point? Do I have two or three alternatives? Um, and by, by putting that into a single file, um, you can then measure. If you use this interface, you know, it's what people are doing with A-B testing on websites. If you do this way of doing your website, is it more likely that somebody will stay in shop? Um, it's a way of doing that within FileMaker. And obviously, that kind of testing can be used to test for failures in our logic and our scripting before it gets anywhere near the file. So when the feature is introduced to the customer by you copying and pasting it into the main file, in fact, you know it works because you it's been tested, the users have tested it, something which... Uh, often doesn't happen enough, I feel. Um, and so the big question, you know, it's, Gary's not here, but obviously he needs to hear this. What about mature systems? Somewhere where you go, no, I just can't touch that. And he can't touch it because he's frightened of breaking anything because it runs a massive great business. But there are all the people uh, who are like that. And frankly, as a business use case, if our answer to every problem is, oh, we'll have to rewrite, we'll have to rewrite that, then everybody knows that that never goes to time and budget ever. And so what's happened is the customer's just paid a large amount of money to get back to exactly where they were before you started. Maybe it's pretty and maybe you've tidied up a number of things, but ultimately it usually is a large amount of money to get back round around about one time um, so if you kind of are able to add a feature by saying oh here's how to do this a it means you don't have to touch the core system which you might not even be wise to do um, but you are adding value straight away um, to to the to the to the system all kinds of reasons why we might do that as well. So we all have to look at our systems when GDPR came along. How do we how do we cope with PII? How do we cope with not downloading all the HR data that you used to be able to do, being able to download somebody's passport photo? So we're, we are bound by regulatory or company rules. What about the fact that in the community, we decide that actually this is a much better way to do this. This is, this is a kind of better practice for how to do something. Um, again, if you can enforce that through a separate file, that may have some benefits. And just being able to, one of the things i particularly keen on is ways that we can stop idiot users from making stuff that we have to validate for later that creates errors. So, you know, getting rid of pasted formatting from websites so that none of your labels line up or adding extra carriage returns that really shouldn't be there so something doesn't fit. Um, doing basic stuff like formatting, allowing you to paste any old phone number in, but have it reformat to a UK, in my case, in a UK format, so that it's easier to read because reading as a string of 11 numbers isn't actually that um, that easy. So I think another, another space for separate files is around features. Um, obviously, the opposite of that is actually equally a compelling thing, which is you've got something and what you really want to do is just put everything back into one box so that you can sort everything out, so you can rebuild 
how the relationships work, maybe normalize the data. You look at inconsistencies where you have the same data stored in an inconsistent way across tables or where you have missing fields and missing keys. Um, often as a result of architectures that don't scale that well and where there are files where you have like several hundred unstored calc fields that related to other calc fields which are related to a total field which is part of another sum um, and we have all met those and wonder why the systems are ridiculously slow but there is a reason on occasion to kind of get get back um i think there's two new things that have come along in the last couple of years though that bring us some new models for how we need to consider biomaker development um one is the i'm going to call it the api model where part of the data is not even in FileMaker. Obviously, traditionally, that has meant ESS. So talking to MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, those kind of things, where part of the data that's uh, in the system is coming from somewhere else. And obviously that may be the right thing to do. But I'm gonna suggest there are now, there is now no reason why for some systems, large parts of the data even need to be inside our FileMaker file. So it's changing how we're considering what the file should contain. So for example, why would you even store documents inside your FileMaker file when you can put them on S3 or Wasabi and just have a link to the file if you really need it? Because then it's, it's backed up, it's not being backed up 15 times a day by your FileMaker system, you don't have to move it off site, you only move it off site once. If somebody really needs it, so like an invoice, it's very rare that somebody, it may be, it may be very rare that somebody needs to actually recover and review the invoice, but you know it's stored somewhere. You can always find it if the accountant wants to find them. And obviously insert from URL is driving a lot of that kind of behavior, as well as external things like Zapier and Claris Connect and um, being able to kind of push data in, but you only push part of the data in, particularly a link to something. Everything from microservices or web services that can write directly into our files, but just a key value. So you know where to go and get the data if you need it. And um, I think we don't necessarily need to consider that the data even needs to be always in the FileMaker file anymore. And there are some places where there's very good reasons why the actual, the, the core record maybe should be somewhere online, like potentially the work that people are now doing with accounts. Where, where is the source of truth of this record? Um, should you just have everything in whatever you're using, QuickBooks slash Sage slash something else? Um, if you have transactional emails, does that live in the email server? Something like uh, Shopify or some other kind of cart based thing. Do you really need to drag all of the data from the record back into FileMaker or just you need some kind of reference in EID or a UID to be able to say, oh, there is a record there with some data. And then I'll just bring a sub, I'll bring a subset. Like what's the order number? What's the date? What's the person? But actually the order details, if I need to know them, um, I can always use that reference with an insert from UL to just grab the data into memory, process it, and go, it's this order. Now, please click the button to confirm you send it. And then it pushes straight back to that other system. So I think that's one model where we're kind of looking at changing how the files themselves might work and what they're kind of designed to do. So again, you might just have multiple files, one for each of those feature kind of things. Um, and I think the other big one is around queuing. So a definite reason why you might have more than one file is being able to do things asynchronously. So the, the idea of a queue, so I, a question I want to ask is in the middle of a process where you want to send an email to a customer, but it's in the script that you are writing but you have to wait for the email to connect and send and have a confirmation that it's been sent. Do you actually need that?
or if you take that record and push it into a queue, the, the queue will, like within a minute, trigger and send the email for you, and maybe even write back to your record the fact that it got sent. Would it speed up the scripting to be able to say, oh, just send that off there to another file and let that file handle it? So we, we, turn, we can turn file making into an async process. You just offload some stuff to the queue. The queue handles it. If it failed, you get a notification or you can go and see which things didn't work. So you could resend an email because it's sitting in the queue and it didn't get delivered or sent. Um, equally, the opportunity to resend exactly the same email as you, when somebody goes, oh, I didn't get the email, um, you can go and resend the same thing. Because if you try and run the same report now on the database, the data is no longer the same as it was three hours ago. And so you can't actually regenerate the report unless you've saved it. But if you have, again, off in a queue file, something that said, this is what I sent you, here's the PDF, here's la 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 la. Um, I think in a, in a similar vein, some of the other functions that work well with a separated, uh, with a separate file to do a job is stuff like error logging. So you can error log across a whole system, not just for a single file. And then you could, you can clearly compare um, across parts of the system. Um, been doing some work just the last couple of weeks on, on a, a way that one of my customers wants to do audit trail. Um, so I'm effectively using the execute data API script step to capture a record as we start modifying it. And the same thing at the end when we finish modifying it. And if there are any differences between the two, then just take the differences and put them into a record in an audit trail file. So you're not trying to store the audit trail locally, which somebody then has to plow through but you end up with a file, with a table that you can search by custom number or by unique ID and show all the changes that ever happened to a single record. It means they have access to that. Um, I think that's another good reason to consider effectively async, push it off to somewhere else. And obviously the thing that's driven some of that happening is that if we've all started, to, if we've all have all started to standardize, standardize on using JSON to pass our script parameters, um, obviously the kind of interchange part of that becomes a lot easier. And uh, just a reminder to everybody that if you're using either the data API or OData, it costs us nothing to push records into another file. We're not, we're not charged for that. We're only charged when we make a query back in terms of it coming off our data allowance. Um, so the, that's not an expensive way of doing it and it may be you may be pushing more data over the network but it may be just as fast as writing to a local table where some of the fields are indexed you've got to rebuild the index every time you add a record so uh, clearly there are issues either way around with making a decision about what's the right structure for how your files work stuff like security is one that has to be managed actively. But obviously, not everybody has the availability of, not everybody has Active Directory on site, not everybody's big enough to do that or want to do that. So while a lot is being touted about, it does work, um, you know, and it's now gonna be adding, signing with Apple, as well as Google, Microsoft, uh, Open Directory, Active Directory. Those, those solve one problem, it pushes the problem onto IT. But then you need to make sure that IT have set everybody up correctly with the right groups, as well as the technical hoops you have to jump through. Um, but that is one thing to consider. And obviously, as ever, whether it's one file or multiple files, there are always edge cases about. So what? How does this? Does what does this work well for? Um, and what does it not work so well for? So maybe the fact of global fields or global variables, which you are only in scoped in a file does or you know which bits work well across multiple files which bits don't work well so the number of things that we have to consider beyond the basic what are we trying to do um so final slide is around some work i've been doing at the moment um using odata as the method of transport 
And this is a model I'm going to propose. Um, and hopefully we'll be speaking about it, engage you in November. Um, so if you have file A, um, in which there is some functionality uh, that you wish to, to act on another file. Um, file B is effectively this, the idea of this machine, this module in the middle that has all the functionality. So from file A, you can run a script which passes um, parameters to file B, but with OData can run a script. So you go run this script in file B and here's all the data that you need. And because it's OData, file A does not have a file reference to file B because it's, it's in the data, it's in the script or it's in the table in data. So there are no external file references. File A does not know that file B exists other than by a record. If you have passed some data to file B, it can act like a machine and return a result. But if what you pass to file B is, here is the stuff I would like you to do in file C and file D. Here's where they are. Here's what they're called. Here's the username and password for them. So you work through those parameters and file B can run a script in file C and get a result back which you store, and then it can also run a script in file D and get a result back, and that can be in as large as you like. So you've, you've run scripts in other files and got all the results back as a big block. But again, you have no references from file B to file C and file D at all. There's no external reference to manage. There's only a single user account you need to manage, which is the user account to run the OData uh, script. You collect the results and what file B does at the end of its script is go, okay, file A, here's all the results back. Did any of the things that you asked, you asked me to do, did they all work? Did any of them fail? Uh, what's just gone on? Without a single external file reference between any file. So there's nothing to manage. There's no, there's no, the user accounts in file C and D are just about the user accounts that are required for people to log in and do their work. So um, I have this working with file A is in fact a file of users that somebody in IT has access to. They add a new user. Um, it's running the native FileMaker scripts in files C and D to add a user account with a password or turn it off or kick them out completely by using file B in the middle. Um, and so the person who's the person who's managing the user's file doesn't even need to know what those other files, how to get to those other files. They don't have a, they don't have a user account in them. Um, and I know whether or not the script that I ran was successful without any external file references. Um, so that's a quick heads up uh, on potentially something that will be fully fledged later in the year. Um, if you want to hear, like spend an, spend an hour listening to me and Todd and Martha talking through some of that stuff. Um, it's on the, the Context podcast and it's the episode from April this year. Um, that's me uh, finished with that. The idea of that was to go, here's a load of stuff. Um, what, what kind of thoughts do people have in terms of things where they go, you're wrong there, or I had never thought about that before. Um, or anything else, or things that I might have missed. From the, from the room of, uh, of all of us sitting here, the thing that piqued all of our interests was the audit uh, file. We all, we all went university, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah you, you kept us going until that point. Oh well, yeah, okay, now, we're now, now we really understand. Yeah, this, this is good. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating talk, John, full of really interesting stuff. Uh, really thought provoking. I might have to go and watch that again <laughs> to, uh, to take um, the, all the, the PowerPoint notes will be available tomorrow, but they are just like, you know, headline notes. It wasn't a fancy presentation in that sense. But... Okay, I'll put them up on the FM bug site as well. So, yeah. I mean, John, is there any stats between FileMaker and talking to external data sets like SQL? through, you know, straight through the MVPC drive and things like that. Is there any wins or losses on that at all? Or? 
or any research uh, being done? I think people have done stuff anecdotally when they kind of had a need. I think the work, the work particularly that Honza brought to the community a few years ago, which was just measure everything, uh, applies here. So the issue is you can have this particular type of server under this kind of setting. So I, I worked with somebody, um, they have Siemens controllers on machines. Um, they, using a particular protocol, they, they can write records at millions of records a second natively into SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server. And so they did that and we would pick up the data. So things like temperature sensors, they were literally recording temperature in a room every 15 seconds. You create a lot of records in a day, but actually there's a reason why you want to see if the temperature spiked at a particular point when a process failed. So the issue is that's a very specific use case. Well, you have to test in this LAN, under this circumstance, how does this work for me? Is it fast enough to be able to run that query that I'd like to run, or is there some other way I need to do it? So the idea for me would be, well, measure everything, work out what your environment really is, and start to measure it and see if there's, if it, does it work? What is too slow? What does too slow look like? Is it sub 20 milliseconds or is it sub two seconds? What's appropriate? Um, and obviously each of those in a different environment depends where it's hosted, depends on the LAN, depends if you're remote. Every time you'll get a different answer with a different setup. The question is, um, what is fast enough? What's what's performant enough? Can you, can you write simultaneously? That feels like the right answer. It's the answer that says, no, I don't think there are any specific statistics but go and make some, go and make your own and compare yeah. compare A with B. I'd say you have a whole bunch of different options there rather than just using the execute SQL. You can always use a custom function. You can use the data API to get data that you want. And you can call a script to the data API to collect the data that you want. So there are more opportunities than just using the execute SQL to get to certain part of the data. Besides everything else we can do natively with FileMaker. But I do, I want to go uh, along the road a little bit what John actually said here and say that um, uh, on all my solutions that I build, most of them have some kind of an integration towards something else. And I always have a specific file for my integrations. So there is no uh, other TOs or a table group occurrences that that's kind of fact the way that they work. Because from what, what John said here, that's really important is you don't load data in a server file where you don't have any fields on your layout or anything like that. So that file just hold empty layouts where you do your calls, where you create your records or whatever it might be. And the same thing when you have a web file, you have a web file where you don't have any users going to. So you don't only need to show records uh, in the table view. So it goes a lot faster for every record to be loaded because you don't have to load any CSS. So there's a whole yeah. bunch of other things you can think about as well as all those things that John said. Good. The things that scare me. One is, how do you document it? And B, if you were no longer the, the, the core developer, how the hell would you pick that up and understand what the hell is going on in all those files? Uh, so, uh, so if you start working on a separation module, I think you will uh, really fast start picking up on a good way of doing documentation. Like scripts are really good, the writing documentation. You write uh, um, comments throughout the relationship graph to tell you what the different purposes were for this table occurrences group and such. So uh, along the way, you will start picking up things. And, and then the same thing that I told you about calling different ways. There's also ways of measuring if your server is busy by the number of collected uh, users. So you would know whether or not you should import a file directly to the, to the database or that you should just let the user drop the file into a container field and download that one on the server and import it on the, on the server. So there's a whole different kind of things to measure to see where the best proper things is to do right now. And, and like Jan said here, uh, Honsa, he is really the guy to look into the right process if you want to optimize your solution. 
I I think the other thing is by 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 using a modular approach to our scripting. So, you know, again, it's a bit more work, but why would you ever have more than one script that sends an email? You have a single script that handles all of your email send or sending, and you call that with some JSON parameters. So therefore, the functionality part of that is easy to understand because it's in one script. What you have to understand is, well, what parameters are being sent? And that's what you can document in the header. So then, you know, I have a standard template in my systems, which contain quite an extensive header where I record what are the incoming parameters that I'm expecting? What are they called? Um, again, picked out from a number of other people and being required to do it for certain systems. Um, so you kind of go, well, clearly for an email script, you have a to and a from and a subject and a body and you have HTML body. So you call your you call your kind of parameters things that make sense. Then anybody can read any of the calling scripts and go, oh, okay, you're sending an email. This is the set of parameters that is going to be sent. So it becomes to some level self-documenting um, as well. You know, you add specific comments, but actually the JSON parameters, because if you calling things, if you're sending a JSON parameter, for example. I will always send a JSON parameter called refresh object so that at the other end, I can refresh an object called refresh object. Just a very simple thing. Well, that has become self-documenting if that's then consistent through your system as well. Um, I, I get the wider point about the architecture side of it. You should be writing a, should be writing a database design report that goes with the file explaining all the clever tricks that you've done is the other answer. And the customer should be requiring that from you. I, I really like the um, the idea of, of sort of joining up a, a lot of the, the things that we've seen you do there. So I'm thinking particularly of having an API separation model. So you've got all of your API scripts in one file that you can reuse. So if, you, if yep. you've got a, a zero, location, you have the zero file, and you plot that in, and you just integrate with that. Oh, what a great idea! Instead of popping that up, because you know. I have to configure the way I do these things for each solution that I create. But now, now I've seen this, <laughs> the error of my ways, I can just <laughs> save the file, uh, just you know, select different configuration. As you say, JSON parameters will uh, will tell it what to do. It's perfect. Yeah. Is that the when, when and if you feel like you have to divide a data file up? There is a really good use of using an analyst tool, like for example, base elements, they will tell you all the reference points for a file. So uh, I, I never, I always try to uh, split my files up before they reach like 10 gigabytes because of backup reasons. And if they need to be repaired, it's just going to take too long of a time. So then I use base elements to figure out where all the references are, and then I can split it up in files with a good name for a certain type of data. And, and then it's easier to handle the data on each side. You don't have to have so massive amount of relationships because the, the table occurrences become smaller. Yep. John, was your, um, in your last slide, your impetus for wanting not to have external data sources defined, versatility or security um, or? It started as a, does this work and can I do it? Yeah. Is the truth. Because I, I, I've i done something similar, but this was an experiment with OData, which I wanted to go, how far does OData take me in terms of giving me more freedom? I've done a similar thing in the past with external file references. And this was about, can I, can I, can I actually break that link completely? Um, and what's the advantage? Well, that file in the middle that I know can handle setting up user accounts, I can put into anybody else's system now because I know it works. Um, that's that's the big bonus. And literally, uh, the point is, as long as you have passed it a file name and you know what the user account is in that file name to run the OData script, suddenly you have a so so. 
the win for me on this was being able to set up users with different passwords in different files during the period of testing or with a different privilege set. So you want, I want in the system that I'm finishing off at the moment, one of the directors wants to be able to test things. And we've talked about what that means. Well, he needs to be able to test it as multiple users. I need a quick way to modify his privilege set in multiple files so that when he logs on with the same username and password, he's now a different person. And therefore he can see whether he can see that. That was that was a, the sort of impetus for it. But it was a technical challenge that I was just fancied, does this really yeah. work? And does it work in a way that's performance enough? Um, and I, you know, I've I've added some stuff around that that same file now has functionality about doing work in teams, creating chats, one-to-one -one chats with people. Again, all of that functionality is in that file. It can be used anywhere else. So that file can grow with various bits of functionality. Just pick it up and put it on somebody else's server. All of that functionality then works because you've got a standard way of telling it where to go and what to do. So the end files have four scripts in them. So there's, that's the modular bit, copy and paste those four scripts, run that in there, run that in there. Thank you very much, brand new user account. And particularly it's around the other, the other issue of how do you get rid of a user when they suddenly walk out the building and you want to ban them forever? Can you do that yeah. pretty much? Can you, how instantly can you do that? So, I'm talking to other systems, do you have much need to talk to like SQL databases and, and, and have you got a lot of best practice for that? Um, not personally, but that's only just because of the, the stuff that I work with. Um, most of the SQL bases I took, databases I talk to are, uh, are the SQL behind things like Moodle, which is a VLE in the higher education field. But essentially, the clearly the principles are the same, but I don't some of these core data is in SQL, personally. Yeah, that's, just, that's the world that I'm in at the moment. We've got, we've got two SQL developers and two file maker developers. So we, <clears throat> there's a lot of over on data and we're finding ourselves having an argument. The file maker guys were having an argument with like, do we keep it in SQL or do we just copy it over in file maker and do all that stuff in there and then copy it back and make sure it's all in sync rather than just working live on that, that SQL data set. Hey, yeah, it's Bev here. Um, I'm going to drop in because I'm a SQL BBA. Bev is the it, expert on SQL. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I own the things. Um, it depends on if you have control of the SQL database or not. If, if you're talking about someone's SQL database that you cannot touch other than, you know, get the data and, and maybe put data in there, then it's a whole different animal than if you actually are the uh, DBA and um, have a, a lot more control. But, but the things you run into is the naming conventions. And if you're really careful, that's not an issue or you have a mapping uh, file in between FileMaker and SQL, then that's also not an issue. Uh, so what kind of things are you running into? Um, I mean, to be honest, we're, we're, we're sort of not. I mean, the only thing that maybe we're running into is we're using the ODBC FileMaker connection into the SQL, um, and that's not always reliable. Right. Um, so we've, we've had instances where the ODBC is not joined, so then it's just fail um, and it's picking up on that failure um, and, and it's known when that's not there because it's just going to reference something that's not there and FileMaker's not great picking up on oh I couldn't see it it, it just comes back with right. nothing right yeah uh, there are issues with the driver knowing that we can talk to SQL before we start so um, yeah but we yeah, have that's control a big hurdle yeah, 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 no, so it's just interesting to see what was, because I'm quite confident in going, actually, let's put a lot of our data in SQL, because we've got two SQL developers that 
a full time and they're doing great stuff that is quite difficult to achieve in FileMaker. And FileMaker is just the interim tool showing data to, to the other guys. And there's instances where there's <clears throat> times when they need to interact with that data and change it and um, create purchase orders, for instance, things like that. Um, and at the moment, we are running two separate tables. We're running all the data in FileMaker and then pushing it to SQL and vice versa. It's created in SQL. We're reading it and then putting it into FileMaker. Um, and, so and the other question to come up is, are you totally using ESS? Are you are you considering using uh, the the execute SQL script step for some of that? Um, so yeah, I've hit walls on that really. So we can we can talk to SQL, but now I've learned what SQL does. We can't. There's not a way from FileMaker to trigger all the great triggers that you can do in SQL. So right. Way for, for something to be built in SQL and then file maker to go here run this amazing script that you built and do all this crazy stuff with the data and then just give me back the result so yeah it's just quite a strange place that we're in at the minute but yeah and that's that's the driver issue um, the, the communication between filemaker and the and the and the SQL it's, it all goes through that driver, and if they're not what you need to be, then they're not going to do what you need. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, we're so, working it. Yeah, you know, we employ both. If, if you do, if you do need to trigger scripts in SQL, stored procedures, and so forth, um, ESS isn't very helpful for that. No. But the ex the execute SQL scripts, the execute SQL command can can do that and the, the, okay. are you talking about the function or the script step here uh the um script, sorry script the, step. the script step yeah that's a, it's different than yeah okay. yeah yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> too bad no, they um, named them similar but yeah <laughs> no exactly yeah i mean we we did we did that a number of years ago where we ran into issues in filemaker and we ended up writing a set of stored procedures in in a yeah. SQL database that we we called and just return essentially we just would query it return a record key and then given the record key we would know which record we need to grab from right. the SQL system and, and that's where I started that was before there was ESS yeah it was all import or or use that execute SQL script step um and of course I had my own servers so there were some things I could do, but I did a lot of web development and some of that was serving from the SQL, but there was FileMaker communication in there and there were ways that you could do some things that made it kind of easy both ways, but you had to kind of know both a little bit. Yeah, the, the, the biggest issue with something like ESS is it's, it's really, really brittle. Yes. You're, you're connecting the systems at a level that requires a lot of knowledge of both systems. Yeah. And if, if anything goes wrong, it tends to just kind of break in a really ugly way. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. All right. Thank you. That, I, sorry. Mm. No, amazing. Good to get the insight. Uh, great. Um, We've got uh, 15 or so minutes left, technically. I know that Tony had a question that he sent to the FMBug website, by the FMBug website. Great, Tony, someone's done it at last. <laughs> Congratulations. I don't know if you want to ask that question quickly um, now. I'm sure, there's, there's two. I think one's more interesting than the other. Uh, and the other, I've got a V2 infographic, which if, if I can share my screen, I think it would be useful. Um, I'll do uh, oh, yeah, it's okay. Good. All right. Let me, let me just draw out the, the one that I don't care about as much, but I thought it was, you know, I did actually want to send a question because I know you guys are like, Hey, give us a question. Uh, I was looking, question. I was looking through the community uh, posts and I got to say, uh, I saw a use of this function called trim all, which I don't think is, you know, the most heavily used function in there. 
uh, to concatenate uh, names like first name, last name, middle name, and so forth and so on. So then I was reading the docs, um, which I actually just quit my browser, so I'd send them. But anyway, trim all. And they talk about spaces. They talk about spaces, half spaces, and full spaces. And I was just like thinking to myself, I don't know. I'm pretty good on Unicode. I don't know what's a full space. What's the code point on that? You know, so I didn't totally know what it did. Uh, I've already, you know, concatenating first, last, using the list function, substitute. It just seemed like an opportunity to use another function, uh, you know, just kind of like a Boy Scout merit badge, you know. Um, but uh, but uh, anyway, I thought it was interesting. And it's being recorded. I might tweet it out saying, hey, what is this trim all? What's a full space? What's a half space? Because I do think that uh, FileMaker uh, as a low code platform should have, you know, make it easy for people, even myself. The uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you what I think is the more interesting question, plus an infographic. And I'm going to go fast, hopefully. OK, let me just check, make sure I haven't got anything too scary. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, now I'm gonna uh, see. I'm gonna zoom in. I could actually change my monitor setting, but let me zoom in, and then if you all tell me after I zoom in, is that pretty? Hold on, let me zoom in even more. Is that showing up? Okay, good, yeah. good, good. I don't want to have to change my monitor because bad things could happen. So FileMaker 18 introduced. Uh, uh, what do they call them? File managed script steps. And specifically, they're targeted towards data file. And what's a little bit interesting is they mix in some things that apply to not just data files like the CSVs, for example, or HTML or XML, you know, that have data, but also the binary files. Uh, so they've got, I was like looking, I'm like, why don't they call that get data file exists? Because this apparently works on binary files as well. Uh, and font size, same story. So I was I was getting all ready to criticize that implementation, and then I realized, oh, makes sense. Okay, here's here's what confused me though, and this is the question. So um, so first off, by the way, here's an infographic, and what I do typically when I try and understand something is I I go to the help documents, I copy say the functions, and uh, or the script steps. These are script steps actually, and this is a function. And then I put them all on one page. I print it out and then I stare at it for a little while. And I was like trying to figure out if I understand it. And uh, one of the things I don't understand is create data file. Now this, this here is from their example, straight from the example. Uh, and when I say there, I mean our good friends over at Claris International, um, found my good vision. And then uh, this is example number one, and this is example number two. Now, if you note with example number one, this is, it's a script step. So it's kind of, you know, I'll call it the signature. Maybe that's not the right term, but I'll call it the signature. They like create a data file and it says data text. And, and I was like, well, where, you know, cause if I create a data file, if an Apple script, I'd be like, well, where am I creating it? Uh, and then over here, they say, create a data file. And if you were to read this whole thing, you would realize that's a file path, uh, they file, in the example, they call it file. I say file path because I like to be explicit. File name, file path, file ID. What do you mean file? Can you disambiguate that? So I was like, well, how do I know what folder I'm in? So let's, um, this is by the way, Omnigraph full. And I'm clicking a button and it's loading. So here's straight from the docs. It says creates an empty blah, blah, blah. Specify the path. Uh, oh, don't if, if they don't exist in the specified path, I'm like, but I'm not specifying a path. It's this specified somewhere in here. It says like the path, create an empty data file. Oh, here's what it says. If the path already exists. So probably if I was a little bit more knowledgeable about the FileMaker platform, I would know how to specify that the path exists. You know, maybe it's some other script, probably some other script step where you like choose folder or something like that. Um, but it it's not here. So I sent this ahead of time. I didn't want to stump anybody, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't mind stumping people. Anybody know how 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 you have a pre existing path? Uh, yeah, there's a there's a script step that um, sets the path. I forget what it is. Is it create data path? Something clever, I will say. 
um, but there is a step that sets the path, and then you create the data file in that path. So we think that there's a script step, right? Yeah. Uh, anybody uh, want to venture guess what the name of the script step is? I, I, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. I didn't bother looking it up. It's something like create data path or set data path or something okay. about data path. All right. I'll look for, I'll look for that. Um, just uh, by a show of hands, does anyone think that that uh, function of reference, uh, a link to that uh, particular script step that we assume exists, should perhaps yeah, that, fit good here? That's not true. Tony, that's not true. If you go into FileMaker and open, because I've just done it while you were talking, if you open the create data file, the first value where you have data.txt is empty, and it brings up the standard dialog box saying, you can put in a path here or a variable name. So you have to define the path to be able to do that. So if you've just written data.txt, it won't create the file because it has no idea where to create it, is the okay. answer. Okay, and then um, let's let's go look at example one. This is straight from the yeah, you know the mothership, that's right? Very, that's just a very bad example. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is. A <laughs> All right. You see now. I, I, never mind. I'm just kidding around. I didn't say it, but I am going to disagree. It, uh, so you're saying that that does not work, and this might be if incorrect you, documentation. If, if you were. If you open FileMaker on that on the machine you're on, uh, I'm going to go to my 19 just... machine if I can find it here. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. This is uh, I was playing along at home here. I'm looking at the DB services thing. If you just okay. give it a file name that is just a file name, but no path, it will save it in the same directory as the FileMaker file is, is running, if you're running it locally. So okay. that's, that's a step. So if you click the, if you click next to the brackets to, or go into there. It so here I could path. put a path, right? So we know a path would yeah. work, that would be logical. And then I heard someone say yeah. that- If, you, if, if you... you just type the file name, it will save it in the same directory as your FileMaker file. Okay. Um, it, so it's the same as export, basically. Okay. So in other words, where it says if the path already exists, if that indeed means exactly what you said, that it saves it in the FileMaker, I would assert the path always exists because it's hard to run FileMaker without FileMaker. Sorry, no. The right. I mean the 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 actual FileMaker file that you oh, the file. Open. The file. Okay. Yeah. Well, then it should just. Don't look, know what I'm not sure. Uh, let me. This do is why I have to say. But... Uh, obviously, if if you have the greatest software platform that's ever been created in all of human history, which indeed is what FileMaker is, <laughs> then uh, since we're being recorded, the um, then you certainly should explicitly say what you just said. Um, what the gentleman said. Who was that? Who said that? Oh, uh, Ian. I did. Oh, it was Ian. Okay. All right, for the record, Ian says that it should say that, <laughs> and I agree. Um, anyway, so, okay, if the path already exists, uh, in other words, save it next to the data file that's open, if that's true. Um, you know, I'm, 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 this is not going to affect my life beyond the fact that I'm, you know, every time I do an infographic, I just try and understand. And I saw that, and it's like, ah, that could be more clear. Let me bring it up to the right and let me put a couple of questions in uh let's record it and then i'll tweet it out and uh apprise um the community that this is uh the way that it is so and in yeah. in that example there because i've just done it because ian is a star um that will create a file called open speech marks data dot text close speech marks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what was I, I, I did notice that as well. That was a bit strange. But... <laughs> Where's Doug when we need him? <laughs> um, well, all right, so that's making the server better. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will play around with it, and and actually, let me just because I did it. Um, things uh, the, I read, uh, I looked at the docs, I read a bunch of blog posts. Uh, if I ever post this, I'll do attribution. Um, so I'm going to confuse who said what in the different blog posts on this. 
reading resets the file position, which is also the separate set data file. So I thought that was interesting. Um, somebody mentioned that uh, Windows doesn't like UTF-8, which was surprising. I got to test that, that they prefer UTF-16 for some reason. I don't know if that's even true, but I heard that. Uh, delete file, not everyone mentioned it must be closed. These are the things that I saw some of the docs didn't weren't comprehensive. Uh, empty, make it 64. Those are my little tool tips. But other than that, uh, awesome feature, as I mentioned, greatest platform ever. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, thank you for uh, helping me uh, ask the audience. It's the best. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for, A, being the first person to actually send us a question via the website, which is great. <laughs> More people need to do that. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't manage to get it in the agenda. It was all a bit. No, no, I mean, so. well, we, we, we totally got, I'm, I'm completely satisfied and uh, I'm really good at saying, I don't know. <laughs> One of the best <laughs> possible great. answers anyone could ever give. So, yeah, so thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you're satisfied. <laughs> I would come back. Uh, I would recommend it to a friend. Okay. Um, technically, we're now in the, uh, the virtual bar for those who are virtual. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's spoken and contributed and given answers and been so generous with everything that they know, which is great. Really enjoyed it. And it's good to be back. Um, hopefully we'll have another fun packed one next time. Um, thanks to everyone.